Hello, I'm Ashley Vance, a writer at Bloomberg Business Week, and you are here to see a chat with Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, who's kind enough to join us from New Zealand and obviously from a uh, from the Rocket Factory that I've been to before. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Pete. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I think we must be catching you pretty early in the morning, eight o'clock or so. Eight o'clock is not early in the morning. <laughs> Two o'clock is early in the morning. Eight o'clock is not early in the morning. <laughs> um, so I'm sure we have a lot of space buffs on here, but you know, for people who are not space buffs, I was just going to do a little bit of the backstory on kind of how I heard about you and met you the first time. And, and I think it was around, oh. yeah, I think it was like 2016. I mean, I, you know, I've been following the space industry and, and I'd been hearing about Rocket Lab, but then, you know, I started to hear that, this crazy guy in New Zealand is getting really close to, to launching a rocket. And um, and so I went down there for Hello World, the TV show we make. And um, you were actually the first episode we ever ever shot. So you were kind to put up with us. But um, yeah, I remember it was 2016. You were in a different factory. And there was. You guys had, I think, three rockets kind of ready to go. And and since 2016, you guys have got on this, this tear. I mean, there's tons of companies trying to launch these small, cheap rockets and and to get lots of stuff to space. And you're really the only ones who have, who have been able to make it and launch successfully so far. I think you're up to about 12 successful launches? Correct, yeah. We just twisted the, the 11th just before the lockdown. Okay, and so so you guys have you carry satellites to space, and and you're on this mission to have to bring down the, the the cost of rockets, and to be able to launch just you know most of the big launchers go about once a month, and you guys want to get to every three days and maybe every day. Yeah, I mean the, the target right now is to um, to get to one one every month and one every two weeks this year, um, and um, continue to drive down the down the pace and. In free, in, in, well, increase the frequency and drive down the cost per the year. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that kind of sets the stage a little bit. And then I just wanted to use this as an opportunity for people to get to know you a little bit better and, and to know the company better. Um, but And you, I don't want to make this too virus heavy or anything, but obviously, <laughs> um, you know, this this is the reality. How, how has... I think we've all seen the reports about what's been going on in New Zealand, that you guys have had a very strict lockdown, that that you've kind of tamped down the virus. So, you know, what has this done for an industry like the aerospace industry? Um, how have you been able to operate during all this? Yeah, so, I mean, for us, obviously, we had to shut down the entire factory and production. Um, but, you know, Rocket Lab people are very resourceful people. Um, so uh, we took this opportunity to do a lot of the, a lot of the work that, um, you know, we've, we've often... Uh, wanted to do but just never had you know time in the production schedule to do so I would say that um, the team has been really really productive uh, down here in New Zealand um, we have a very big program right now which is the um, the NASA mission to the moon so that is a very big um, project for us so that that project got a lot of attention which was really great to move that forward quickly um, and um, you know we, we're able to uh, you know, a lot of the you know a lot of the company was able to be really productive on their way through and then um, you know some some of the teams um, took uh, took various equipment home and and we had uh, we had the uh, Steph who who leads our harness group um, building harnesses at her house um, and the test team you know took home equipment so uh, it's it's very very not even a virus can stamp out Rocket Lab um, <laughs> the team was was very resourceful and um, we're able to, to to make good use of it but um, we certainly you know. Uh, we won't be be launching again here till um, the end of the month, um, uh, and you know that certainly you know inhi inhibited our ability to launch, which is which is tough. But as you can see behind me, there's there's a you know there's a whole bunch of rockets all stacked up. So yeah, um, we're, give, we're ready to ready to go. I give you props for for the uh, the background on a on a live event. I think you win. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know. And, so Oh, sorry. Well, so the next launch that you mentioned, I mean, so that you you guys, you along with SpaceX, um, have a private private launch facilities, and and so you have a pad in New Zealand on the North Island on the East Coast in sort of like the most beautiful place you could ever imagine, and then you're building another another launch facility on the East Coast of the United States, and you have a another pad coming 
in the at the New Zealand site as well. And so, so how yep. how have things been affected um, with the construction at the U.S. site? Well, the U.S. site is complete. Um, so we actually we rolled the rocket out, uh, you know, just before lockdown, and um, and it, that that site's complete, ready to go. So we just, um, you know, the final the final thing there is certification for from from NASA for our AFTS. Um, system at autonomous flight termination system that we fly um, out of that range and and we're good to go so um, that pad's complete there's a rocket sitting there already uh, there's another another vehicle sitting down at the pad in Mahia um, and the the second pad at Mahia will be will be complete by the end of the year so we'll have three operational pads by by the end of the year um, and currently have have two so yep plenty, plenty of plenty of capability and what do you, you know, so you, it's very capital intensive business. There's mm. a bit, there's a bit of a race going on in that there's, there's, I think there's like dozens of small rocket companies, it's obviously only kind of like a handful mm. that, that you might consider, um, you know, more legitimate than others. And, uh, you know, funding is tougher to come mm. by right now. You guys have this huge head start in terms of, of already completing so many launches. So, you know, like, I mean, but it was, it's a very exciting time for the new space industry because we had all this money pour in. We had tons of rocket yeah. companies, tons of satellite companies. Um, what, you know, we've already seen one web, a big satellite company file for bankruptcy um, as they were not able to raise funds. So what do you like for the, as far as the new space industry goes, um, how, yeah. how damaging do you think this, this pandemic will be? I think it's fair to say that the, the new space industry has had a long, warm summer, um, and there's been a lot of capital flow and a lot of good times. Um, I think probably you know November last year or thereabouts, the last half half of last year, I really felt that things were getting out of control because um, the, the the kind of things that were being invested in had you know had, had very you know tentative business plans attached to them, and it's you know very very far looking. Uh, which is great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, um, it's great to um, you know to, to to really look in, you know, decently down the road. But um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, venture capital still requires a return at some point in time. So you saw some business plans that were pretty sceptical, um, and stuff get funded that that um, you know even I was sort of looking <laughs> sideways at as like, oh, okay, good on them. That's awesome. Um, and I guess I'm. I'm I'm slightly uh, slightly biased because I remember the days of, you know, walking around the valley, um, trying to raise capital, and and everybody you know looking super cross-eyed at me. It's like, well, you know, what's this what's this guy trying to do? Yeah. Um, and it sort of became the norm. And I think we saw a tremendous amount of capital flow into small launch, um, and uh, and you know it's just not sustainable. So um, unfortunately, there is going to be uh, a bit of consolidation. But you know, with with any crisis, you know, um, it's a good opportunity to to leverage it. And um, you know, there's a, a lot of really good um, entrepreneurs and space companies and technologies that um, I think you know um, will will combine and and build bigger entities and and do do good things. So um, I'm pretty confident that you know I guess I take a much longer term view than 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 just like a you know one or two year view. I think you know the overall temperature for the will be will be just fine but um it's going to be a pretty rough road here in the next uh, the next you know 12 to 18 months because capital is going to be non-existent well especially on the, the satellite side too because obviously you guys need customers to fly yep. and and there there were i think several dozen satellite companies that had, that had appeared and and um even though it doesn't take quite as much money as rockets it takes a lot of money <laughs> yeah yeah no, no it does no yeah, and and we we had always um, purposely divorced ourselves from um, from accounting for the mega constellations in any of our business plans, uh, because the moment you you start to to build a business plan around uh, a mega constellation or build build a business plan around somebody else's startup, um, that that's when it gets pretty pretty dodgy. So um, you know we we'd never taken into account will proclaim that we're going to fly 300 rockets a week or you know some so some of the numbers that I've heard are just crazy so um, you know we we're we're very much um, you know a, a bespoke service for customers that that care about um, you know on orbit on time you know exactly in the right place when they need it um, yeah. rather rather than um, you know we uh, we you know we we're, we're more of a um, i guess like a limousine service than 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 a than a Costco. So um, 
<laughs> the uh, in I just want to so people are sending in questions, which is great. I sort of had like a a path um, sure. of questions I want to take, but but I'm you know just just I want to throw a couple at you that are coming in um, just while we're here. So I you know the, uh, there was a lot of people asking about um, to date you've you've focused on putting satellites into low Earth orbit. Uh, you mentioned yeah. you mentioned that you've got a, you know a lunar mission. Um, could you? I want you to do two things. Can you describe the lunar mission, and then and then we're getting yeah. a lot we're getting a lot of questions about Rocket Lab's ambitions through the the solar system yeah. and and what kind of things you guys would do. Um, so first first the lunar mission. Well, I, I'll, I'll actually answer that round the other way because it makes more sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind. No. So, um, so I guess, uh, you know, pe people look at Rocket Lab as a rocket company and um, really it, it's, it's probably a, a failure on my behalf, my behalf calling it Rocket Lab because it was never intended just to be a rocket company. Um, but Rocket was the, the first piece of the building block that we needed to solve. Um, there's no point in, in solving the satellites if you can't get them there. So, um, you know, we're very much a space systems business. Um, you know, we've started to build spacecraft, um, hence the reason, you know, you've, everyone's seen that we won that, that mission, um, you know, to the moon for NASA. And although that's, you know, that, that's a high energy upper stage, it's actually our, our photon satellite platform um, because we stay in orbit for a very long time and we do lots of maneuvers and I'll talk about that in a moment. But, um, but, but you know, we're, we're building satellites flat out um, we just acquired a, a satellite company, satellite components company, Sinclair Interplanetary. Uh, we have uh, contracts with governments to manage their satellites on orbit. And we've really, we're really trying to provide an end-to-end -end solution. So, you know, if you have a sensor um, or a capability that you're trying to create, just come to us and we can build a spacecraft platform. We can launch it. We can operate it. Um, we have, a, you know, a, a unique agreement with KSAT, the, the ground stations you know, provide us to, to be able to really provide, you know, a global network of, of, of ground link. Um, and, um, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do here is just make it easier to get innovation and ideas on orbit. And the rocket piece is, is one important piece, but it's just one piece of that. So, um, you know, if you look at our kick stage, I'm surprised that more people didn't pick it up way sooner, because if you look at our kick stage, it's just a satellite. Um, you know, it does, it, it's, put a solar panel on and it's a satellite. Um, so it, it was per very purposeful that we, we did that. So, you know, the, the, you know, the increment from a kick stage to a satellite is very small. Um, so, um, you know, really uh, we've been in, you know, every, every uh, over the last 10 missions, we've actually operated our own satellite on orbit um, every time we fly. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, I, th I think, you know, we've, we've been building that for quite some time. And, um, you know, the, the, the lunar mission is, is really just a high energy photon. So, um, you know, we, we take all the components through in a photon um, and we've upgraded the Curry engine to be, it's called Hyper Curry now, to be a much, uh, much more high performance uh, engine for this, you know, for these types of missions. And that gives us a platform to, um, you know, to do things uh, like take, you know, 37 kgs to the moon um, and similar masses to Venus and, and less mass to Mars. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a, if you look at the photon satellite platform, you, at one end of the spectrum, you've got uh, like a, a kick stage, which is a very basic satellite. Through to the other end of the spectrum, you have a super high energy um, mega complex interplanetary probe. So um, we really try and cover the full gambit with, with that capability. And so, in in, I mean, I saw you jumping on to some of the Twitter qu questions, you know, about this. Like you, you were talking about Venus. Um, mm. So, you know, what? Given that, okay, so with the big rockets, the massive rockets, you know, we've got guys wanting to colonize Mars and take, yep. you know, tens of thousands of tons of equipment and 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 you know, build habitats and everything. So, with a with a smaller rocket, I mean, what, if you get to Venus, what kind of things would you be able to do? Well, you have, we have about 25 kgs of science instrument mass. So um, you have to remember that the photon platform, you know, power supplied, thermal supplied, comms is supplied, everything supplied. So it's pure scientific mass. Um, so 25 kgs, you know, might not sound like much, but um, actually, you know, you can do a lot there. You can mass spectrometers, multispectral images. Um, you know, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of instrument that you can, you know, 
you can put on there. But I guess the, the, the most exciting and liberating thing about this is that if you wanted to go to the Venus, uh, if you wanted to go to Venus, uh, be prepared to write, you know, two, three hundred million dollar check minimum. Um, with with a you know an electron and a photon platform, we reckon we can get to Venus for twenty million dollars or less. Right. So um, as far as uh, you know, opening opening kind of the the door for planetary science, um, it's it's ju it's just enormous. Uh, and you know, you you can do half a dozen missions or more, a dozen missions for the same price as as, as one mission, and do them quickly. Um, yeah. You know, Venus twenty twenty three. Venus is is close. So you know. If we're going to do some missions of Venus. It needs to be 2023, so it's quick. And I know I've asked you this question before. I'm not sure I always believe your answer, so I'm going to ask you again in public and put you on the spot. Um, you oh, know, so, <laughs> I mean, you've always said from the beginning of Rocket Lab, you know, part of your part of your dream, your mission was was to get the prices down, get the frequency up, make it where where we can just do a lot more stuff in space and create like mm -hmm. a prop, you know, a proper economy. So I totally get that mm -hmm. and, and you're heading on that direction. Obviously you have other people like Elon and maybe Jeff Bezos who like we said, you know, their their dream of colonies and and um taking the human species sort of off earth. And mm -hmm. so so I've always asked, I mean I've, I've always been curious. I mean like when you when you channel you deep into your your childhood or your kind of sci-fi fantasies i mean is it does it end with kind of this burst of economic and scientific activity or what you know what is what's like what is your ultimate dream what are you trying to achieve um with with rocket lab yeah that's a great question and and as you point out um you know, uh, a, a space vehicle company gives you an ability to do wonderful things for humanity and uh, going to other planets, um, you know, and and humans stepping foot on moon and other planets. It's awesome. I'm, I'm in the front row cheering. Um, but I, I guess I, I take the view that, um, you know, it's slightly more clinical and engineering view is, is that, you know, space is a place to build infrastructure. The infrastructure that we currently have in space is, is absolutely critical and life-changing for so many industries you, you know you take gps it's it, it covers everything from from maps through to national security through to uber and tinder like it is covers a, it's a huge spectrum of, of things that that and, and good that that provides to everybody down on earth and i just believe that um if you can make it easy and affordable to build lots of infrastructure in space then lots of wonderful things are going to happen down on Earth. And if if you you know you, you've been to the to the factory, probably not this one. Did you go to this factory? Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I've yeah, yeah, there. yeah. That's right. Sorry, yeah. you do. Yeah, you remember as you walked in the main door. You know, the first thing you read is we 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 go to space to improve life on Earth. And and you know, space is one of those things where there is, there, are, there are no borders. Um, and when you put up a spacecraft, you know, you you provide services to all of the countries around the planet every ninety minutes. So as far as infrastructure that has the ability to touch the entire population of the, of the planet, you know, that is, that is space. So that is, you know, that, that's, that's my prime driver is I think we, we can improve a lot on earth um, through leveraging um, the things that space has to offer. So you now, in saying oh, that, yep. So in saying that it's not, it's not like I don't have my own little, um, my own little, fetishes myself and and you know venus is is clearly one of them um but uh, i think uh as you know as, as a company and what we can actually you know the mark that we can leave in history and the mark we can leave on humanity will be um will, will be building infrastructure and all that so everybody else is talking mars and you're you're claiming venus then well, um, it's, not, it's not really claiming. I don't think anybody can <laughs> claim a planet. Um, I, I've always been interested in Venus, and you know, the the photon platform. Um, you know, the the original work was done by Richard Hunter, um, who who is a is a PhD student that, um, that that we hired, and you know, his, Richard's job was see how far you can get with um, using an electron, doing some crazy orbital mechanics, and really the the, the impetus behind that was I want to get to Venus. Um, and, uh, and and I guess you know Mars Mars has received a lot of press because Mars can this captures the public's imagination because you can step foot on Mars and you can put a footprint on Mars, and that is awesome. Um, so everybody can you know that, that's that's very visceral that's that's exciting. 
Um, Venus, you, nobody's ever going to step foot on Venus. Um, you know, it's the atmosphere. The atmosphere's four hundred something degrees C. Ninety atmospheres of pressure. You, you're not. You're not standing on the surface of Venus. However, um, for me, uh, if I look out into the solar system, um, there's there's kind of three um, three universally understood places in our solar system where life may exist, and one of them is Venus. And the way I look at it is, is this is humanity's greatest treasure hunt, like the biggest question. Um, you know, are we are we alone? And, and when I say that, I mean any life. And there's a really interesting um, uh, position in Venus's atmosphere where it's just sort of down in a sweet zone where it's one atmospheric equivalent to one at atmospheric pressures of, of Earth. Um, it's not a particularly nice place. It's very acidic and horrible, um, but moderately temperate. Um, and there's some weird stuff going on there with some UV absorbing things that nobody really quite understands. And it's, it's at least in, in principle, some extremophiles from Earth should be able to live there. So you've got this, this, this weird cloud that whizzes around that absorbs UV radiation, UV uh, light. Um, you've also got an environment which in theory could support some kind of life, microbial, bacterial life. Um, so we need to we need to sort that out. We need to go there, and um, you know, I I just I, yeah I just want to have a have a crack at that and um, send a couple of you know atmospheric entering probes to see see what we can find. No, that's cool. Okay, I haven't heard you I haven't heard you kind of riff on that before. Um, and then in any other, um, are you like a secret uh, singularitarian trying to spread? humankind's intelligence through the universe or anything, anything, you know, way off in the, uh, the sci-fi realm. No, I, I just, I just quite like to know if we are, if we're unique or not. Yeah. I mean, is, is, is life. Um, yeah. Cause if we, if we can find life in, on, on Venus, then you have to assume that it's pretty prevalent. Okay. I'm just peeking at some of the questions. Um, We've got some hardcore space ones. I'm going to save those, you know, like like technical questions. I'm going to save those for a little bit. There's a lot of people who they are, you know, in New Zealand, and I'm sure I don't know what the situation is in the U.S. But so people who want to watch the the launches and have some kind of um, uh, viewing platform, you know, I know Mahi has a bit of a tough place to get to. Um, but so, what are you what are you guys thinking moving forward around how people can watch the launches? So at LC2 in Virginia, there's there's a really great viewing area um, there. So so that that will be the best view um, of an electron launch by far. The challenge with the Mahia Peninsula is it's such a remote piece of you know piece of land you know sticking out that there's there's not really any good places um, to build uh, viewing areas, and it's all you know private land. So you know we we obviously lease a bit of land that that we're on, but um, you know we, we don't we don't have the rights to to, to go and build grandstands and stuff. Um, and it's on, I, a, know, it's on a sheep farm, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's so, like a, work, a um, working, a working sheep farm. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, yeah. It's great for us. It keeps all the grass down. We don't have to <laughs> mull. It's fantastic. Um, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I think, I think we haven't done anything there. We, we're kind of hoping that some entrepreneurial spirit will come along and, and, uh, and, and go and do that um, off their own back. But, um, you know the night launches are great to watch. Um, you can you can see those from from the beach and from from the, the towns. But um, yeah, it's it's just a really challenging place to, to to build a viewing area. And you know it is still you know it's the only private orbital launch site in the world. So normally these are government lands, and, and you know the government has the ability to do whatever they want on them. But um, this is all private land. Yeah, um, and then the we had obviously there's a lot of interest. So. At first, you guys were not really, at least publicly, looking at reusing rockets. And I, I mean, I think you were actually, if I remember right, I mean, you were, you were, you were not into that idea. And then, and then lately, you've been, you've actually started running, running tests where, um, I mean, and tell me if I describe it poorly, but you would, you would catch the rocket with a helicopter as it, as it kind of re-enters um, after doing its job delivering a, a payload into orbit. And, and so we have questions around, and I know you guys are public about some of this, but uh, sure. you know, people want to know sort of where you're at, when the first one will be, and, and, yep. how, and then maybe if you could go, I know you've discussed it a bit before, but tell me, you know, what, what changed your mind on reuse ultimately? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I was I was always, I was n not not very excited about trying to reuse electron and and you know the way we designed it was to be be disposable um, for the for the pure fact that um, 
you know, in order to to reuse, um, you know, first stage in, in, I would say, quote unquote, the more traditional way, which is, you know, impulsive landing, you take a small launch vehicle and you make it very big. Um, so that, that wasn't really the point. Um, and so, so I, I kind of dismissed the concept um, because whatever concept we come up with, it has to be, you know, the, the mass penalty has to be a maximum of sort of 10 to 15 percent of the total stage um, or, or payload reduction. So that's very, very hard to do. I mean, you, you know, for propulsive landing, you sort of 30 percent or more of, of you know, payload capacity goes to, to, to do that. So, um, so I'd, I'd kind of written it off, but it was once we started flying and, and we started looking at the data and um, you know re re reviewing the, the the ascent data and, and actually you know how the stage was heating or not heating in this case, um, it, it sort of became more more obvious. And then, really, what 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 you know clicked it over for me was standing here and looking out into the factory and thinking, well. If I want to double production, um, that's that's a really hard thing to you know continue to do. Yeah. Um, if I wanted a, an easier way to double production, would maybe to just get one back. So um, so we we started really digging into that and broke the program up into three main milestones. Is one can we re-enter a stage, which is by far the hardest piece of the whole program, is getting it through the atmosphere in one piece. The second part is, um, you know, can can we can we slow it down and get it under some parachutes? Um, and then the third piece is, you know, if we get it under parachutes, can we actually indeed scoop it out of the sky before it lands in the sea? Um, so we've successfully demonstrated uh, two of the three elements. Um, we've re-entered two stages successfully, um, and uh, that was that was a huge milestone. You know, we we're able to. Um, we bought those stages in as hot and as fast as you can. So basically, we just. We did nothing to slow them down. We just bore them into the in, into the atmosphere, <laughs> and um, they both survived. Um, and we had strong telemetry link and a relatively healthy stage until they impacted to see it just under 900 kilometers an hour. So um, that that was super good. And then the, the second piece we've just demonstrated is is collecting it out of the sky because we don't you know we don't want it to splash it down in the water. It's not a good not a good place. Um, and we recently successfully demonstrated. That as well. So the the, the last piece is, um, you know, can we get it under a chute? And that's scheduled for flight seventeen. Is is the one that we're we're shooting for that. So um, that that vehicle is behind me coming down the production line. And you've been you've actually been learning to fly a helicopter. Are you are are you allowed to tr to to try and catch this thing? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not good enough. No, I'm not good enough for that. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I'm. I'm. I can. I can. You know. I happily fly us to the launch site and back, but I am that that is next level skill. Okay, that I, I do not possess. I thought this was part of the the master plan, maybe. Um. <laughs> but it does uh, does help justify owning a helicopter? That is, <laughs> but um, just a real quick one from someone kind of to our earlier conversation is is like how how far out can Electron put a payload in the solar system? Um. That's a good question. So we we did do some trajectories. We called it uh, the Grand Tour, which was like a giant billion year heliocentric um, tour of the solar system. Um, you know, in order in order to get out to somewhere like Jupiter, there's a lot of a lot more energy. So, you know, I would say we're limited in in to the kind of the you know the the near the near cousins. So, um, you know, any asteroid that's cruising by um, Moon, uh, Mars, Venus. Um, uh, I think we can get something to Mercury as well, yeah. Okay. And then there's another one here. Um, I think I might know the answer to this one, but, you know, okay, so I've I've been hanging out with, like, just about every rocket startup you can imagine. And in, in this part of the, the world, um, you know, I'm not trying to set up a softball here or anything. I think Electron is seen as just about, like, the perfectly engineered – rocket for for what you guys are trying to do i mean i know you put a lot of uh, obviously effort and smarts into it there, somebody's asking though you know is that the perfect rocket for the company um you know are there ever plans i don't know to do something different to go bigger um i know mm. you've got a lot on your plate at the moment so but but that's the question you yeah, know that's fair enough uh, I, I think you know as when we when we looked at um, electron and, and where we thought the market opportunity was um, uh, you know naturally I'm biased but I, I think we've we're right in the sweet spot um, because anything much larger than electron um, you, you no longer can really affordably offer a, a dedicated service um, because the cost just becomes too high 
Um, and you, you end up becoming a rideshare. And now you're competing with, um, as a rideshare vehicle, you're competing with SpaceX, PSLV, um, Vega, and, and all of those vehicles. It becomes very, very cluttered and challenging market. Uh, any smaller than Electron, you're not useful um, to be able to lift, you know, useful masses, and you don't have enough energy to, to lift useful masses. So as, as I look at Electron, uh, I, I think, I think you know, it's, it's the right place to be. Um, I worry when I see launch vehicles that can lift, you know, sort of the one ton class launch vehicle, because um, you're just going head to head with SpaceX and Falcon 9 on a ride share. Uh, and that's a tough place to be, um, as, as well as head to head with PSLV and a lot of other, um, you know, really low cost uh, ride share options. So, um, you know, our goal here is to provide, a, you know, a dedicated service like, you know, we're not the bus. If you, if you want to, if you don't care where you picked up, you don't care where you dropped off and you're on someone else's timetable, which is a bus, take the bus. Um, if, if you really care about where you want to go, when you want to go, you take the Uber um, and we are the Uber. Um, and you wouldn't expect to pay the same for an Uber as you do a bus ticket. Yeah. So um, the moment you kind of go larger than that, then you're just in this in this nether region of, of super, um, you know, ride share. And the ride share market is... is it's crazy because you've got like the, the PSLV vehicle, which is, you know, subsidized by the Indian government. Um, so you, you're, you're now trying to compete as a commercial company against a government subsidized launch vehicle. It's just it's not, a, not a great place to be, in my opinion. So, OK, I do have a right share question, though. And so for people who aren't aren't space nerds or enthusiasts, mm -hmm. um, you know, so basically on the, these very large rockets, which might carry one or two kind of bus car sized satellites. There's, there's all these little pockets of space around um, where you can fit smaller satellites. And so you kind of, you hitch a ride. Whereas, whereas you guys take a satellite exactly where it wants to go. And, and the rocket is, is, you know, is built for that mission. Um, but so, you know, SpaceX, I noticed, I mean, Elon used to be fairly dismissive or I guess maybe even like nonchalant about the, the small rocket market for a long time, sort of, um, at least when I would chat with him, he'd sort of be like, I don't even follow what's going on there. And then, and then one day last year, he, SpaceX dramatically cut uh, the prices for their rideshare program, which seems like a fairly since you guys are the only <laughs> small rocket company launching, it seemed it seemed um, it seemed targeted. So, you, I mean, what do you what do you make of SpaceX's moves there? And yeah, I mean, do, uh, you know, I know you just went through this a bit, but does that did that disrupt some business or or your strategy at all? I, I love a bit of competition. Um, bit of a punch up's great, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, so yes, but ironically, the 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 um, you know, the customers that we see the most coming to us are customers that have been promised a ride on a rideshare vehicle that doesn't fly when it said it was going to fly. And, um, and you know, the first SpaceX rideshare was going to fly in March. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing with, with, um, with, with rideshares is that, um, you know, you, you have to wait until everybody's on the bus until the bus leaves. So, um, you know, you, you have... And, like I say, that the customers that are coming to us, um, there is a cost to sitting on the shelf. If you if you have a satellite company and you need to generate revenue, and you sit on the shelf for a year, it's far cheaper to just buy a dedicated Electron launch vehicle, um, and uh, you are in charge of the entire mission, and you get to go exactly where you need to go when you need to go. So you know we see we see a lot of customers uh, actually um, you know punching out of rideshare and buying dedicated launches, sure, we're more expensive. That's, that's a fact. We, you, can't, you can't not be um, and, um, and, and going that way. But I think rideshare is, rideshare is a really important part of the market and the industry um, because, you know, there are a lot of spacecraft that just need tech demos. They just need to get up. Um, and it's, a, it's been really the enabler, I would say, um, to, to enable the, the small satellite industry to grow. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be down on rideshare um, because I think it's, I think it's, it's been instrumental in, um, in growing the industry and we, we do our own rideshares as well. You know, we, we, we will rideshare a bunch of you know, small CubeSats along with micro and, and do all that. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a really important part. 
Uh, yeah, and uh, competing with Elon is always interesting. Um, have you been Have you been following his uh, his Twitter feed the last couple of weeks? No, I'm 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 too, I'm too busy. To be honest, <laughs> I'm 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 uh, I'm yeah. So I'm not I'm not big on social media. Um, okay. So I tweet the odd thing that I think is interesting, but I'm I'm certainly not sitting there, you know, following a bunch what a bunch of other people are doing. We've, you know, we've got to get a mission to the moon. So that that is all consuming. That is hard. Well, he, he's been quite active. Um, <laughs> I'm just peeking at the questions. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more questions in a second. There were there were a couple that were asking is I think you have wireless headphones on. If it's not too weird, can you swivel out maybe and and um, just because your factory is amazing. It's like the you can like perform surgery in there. I mean, can you? I know it's far away, but what can you tell us? Obviously, those are rocket bodies down there. And and what can you just give us a little play by play on the factory? Yeah, so um, in in the very end of the factory behind the flags is Rose of the Robot. So basically, uh, there. So basically, raw material comes in here as a raw tube goes into Rose of the Robot, um, and uh, every piece of um, machining, marking, uh, trimming, uh, it, it's all done in that machine. Then it steps out of the machine, and um, you can see just out past Rosie, there's that first that tube there. So, um, so, so that tube is, is, you know, it steps across into these, uh, these various booths. Um, and uh, the first booth is, is like some coating booth. The second booth is a soundproof booth. So that's where we do all the, um, any noisy operations because having a clean factory is critically important and clean is not just spotlessly clean. It's, it's also from a noise perspective. You can't concentrate building rocket engines in a noise. So uh, basically it goes along and then it, 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 it shoots into these, into these, you know, on that side there's another one as well. These noise you know, soundproof rooms where uh, any, any, you know, noisy operations are completed. Then kind of step across the factory um, and this line here, this line here is, uh, yes, this line here is the final production line. So actually there's, there's one in front of that. You probably can't see. So there's a bunch of rockets here as well. So, um, and th this is where these get shipped out um, to the to the launch site. And then, and and you know how how has um, how have the speeds changed on how long it takes you to make a rocket from like 2016 to today? <laughs> well, every 30 days is one roll off the off the production line now. So. Um, uh, some some parts like composites team are, are are down to one rocket every 18 days, so um, you know the the rest of this year um, you know the team is is striving for one rocket every 18 days, so um, we continue to you know to, to push hard to um, you know in, increase production, but um, yeah, so, so uh, very short. And there's a there's a bunch of questions that that kind of play into that. I'm gonna try to like uh, condense a couple of them, and it, it's a it's a difficult question to answer. But um, you know, just as part of knowing you and and getting into rockets, I've been reading a lot of rocket history, and you know, if you go back, if you go back almost like exactly a hundred years, you had Robert Goddard in the United States and some folks in in Russia and Germany that that were trying to build um, roughly kind of stuff that they that you're trying to build and and over that span of a hundred years hardly anyone has been successful <laughs> at, at doing it um, you know SpaceX made the Falcon 1 and and we've got some other sort of similar things but it's it's incredibly hard to do why you know so this is kind of a two-part question I guess is mm -hmm. we've got this century of knowledge clearly we know how to build giant rockets um, there's people who have done this before who have experience that can go to these rocket startups, but like, you know, why is it so hard to do and, and, and how, you know, to the, I know a lot goes into this. So, but to the extent that you guys did figure this out, kind of how, you know, how did you figure it out? Yeah. So um, the way I think about building a rocket company is um, imagine yourself running through a maze at night and at every dead end there's, there's a guy with a shotgun that will shoot you. So you have to, <laughs> you have to, run, you have to run quickly with you know, very little eyesight or in information and then, but not run too quickly because you need to poke your head around the corner carefully to make sure you don't make the wrong decisions because 
you know, within a rocket company, a wrong decision, one wrong decision can be end. So, you know, blow up a launch pad, blow up an engine test cell, especially early on, there, there's, there's just no recovery. And also going down a technology path that um, is also wrong, there is no recovery. There's no time to back out and go, oh, screw that engine up, design up, we better go back and start again with a new, new engine design. There is just, there's just no, no mistakes. You just can't make mistakes. Um, and then, so, so knowing when to poke your head around the corner and go, um, no, there's a guy there with a shotgun, we need to turn around. And also having the courage to continue down that thing that looks like a dead end, because there's all, it always looks greener, right? You'll get halfway into an engineering problem and you'll think, oh, this is getting really hard. Maybe it would have been easier to do that way. And then you, you forever just bounce around, um, you know, try and try, never, never actually draw to a conclusion. So, so I, think, I think that's part of it. The other part of the magic here is there's a curve, right? And you're seeing it playing out now, right? There, there's a curve where there's this kind of endless analysis that you can do and you can sit in there and just, just analyze, 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 analyze and not build anything. And there's the other end of the spectrum where you can just build something and just keep blowing it up, blah, blah, blah. The, and there's, there's a curve where I believe there's, there's a sweet point, of, sweet point of efficiency and right at the top of that curve there is where if you can get you know, the experimental bit right and the, the analysis bit right, um, so where you don't end up, you know, churning on either end of that scale, um, then you can move move quickly. And I think that's what we've been able to do well is um, do good experimental work to understand physics and fundamentals and, and you know, th where the real grenades lie. And then also quickly always be a very hard rich, a hardware rich um, environment where um, you know, we, we test a lot, and but also we, we do the analysis and the research up the front, up you know, to make sure that we're not running down a path which is just fundamentally flawed. So yeah. it, it's a it, it's a real balance. Were you? I mean, were you like? Are you a rocket his, historian? And just just so people know, I mean, like you are a self taught rocket engineer. I mean, you didn't go to university and do like a PhD in this. Um, you know, you're this world-class engineer who I know, you know, as a kid was was building propellants and, and fuels and all that. So so obviously um, at this from a very young age and had hands-on experience, but like like how much were you into to rocketry history and how much, you know, were you or were you not? And how much did, did sort of that past inform your decision-making uh, to find that right spot to turn the corner? Well, I mean, engineering is engineering at the end of the day. It doesn't really matter if you're building a rocket or a washing machine or whatever it is. I mean, you know, engineering is engineering and logic is logic. So, um, so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think there's, there's anything anything unique about you know about building a rocket it's just that you just can't make mistakes um that that's pretty much pretty much it so um you know uh, i don't i don't like i said i don't i don't think there's 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 anything anything particularly unique there and what about i've always wanted to ask you this i mean so you you were this very passionate driven self-taught guy you and then you start Rocket Lab. It's in a country that has, you know, really sort of like no aerospace industry. And, and you know, I've met a ton of people on your team. It's these very young, um, a lot of Kiwis, a lot of Australians, but people who never had a chance to work on a rocket before because you were the only game in town. Um, so, like... What's your what's your feeling now on sort of like hands-on versus university trained person? Um, how do you... If, if you had to talk to sort of young people who are watching this and, and they mm -hmm. want to get into this industry, I mean, what, you know, what would you advise versus, versus being an apprentice and doing hands-on stuff or, or going to maybe even get a master's or a PhD in aerospace engineering or something or physics? Yeah, well, I mean, f firstly, be, pa be passionate about the thing you want to be in and only do the thing that you really want to, you want to do. Um, my job is not a job. Um, I'm, I'm just, just having fun. Um, so if you can get to that point, then, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a, you're likely to be successful and, um, you know, uh, so, so having, you know, really following your passion, I think is the, is the first thing. And then just do lots of stuff. Um, you know, if, if, when we, we get CVs and you're trying to fill a position, um, you can get a hundred CVs. They've all gone to great universities. They've all got great grades. 
but the person we will hire is the person who on the weekend has built a lot of really cool stuff um, and has has demonstrated that they have a passion just beyond school so um, and, and they'll, they'll win out over someone with better grades every time like you know someone who is 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 passionate energetic and just wants to get stuff done um, will, will always win out and and um, you know you, you can you can make up you know knowledge in a lot of a lot of cases you know for motivation um, all right I've got many big philosophical questions but I'm looking at the time let's go let's go rapid fire to make make the people yep. happy and feel like they okay. got their, their questions answered so um, why why in this business do we pick kerosene and liquid oxygen instead of other fuels well for us I mean it was just a, a it's a good, well understood, easy to handle propellant combination um, that, um, you know, choose where you want to innovate and propellants just weren't the place we wanted to innovate. Um, you're, you guys are pretty famous for being 3D printing a lot of stuff, including your engines and being kind of the first to, to do that. Are the engines 3D printed in one fell swoop or components that are put together? Uh, there's large components that um, that are that are you know, generally still put together. Um, there's about three main components that um, that that are that are assembled, um, and then uh, you know all the all the turbo pump um, and um, and you know transfer lines are all still 3D printed. Uh, you guys have some pretty classic mich mission names like uh, it's business time, a little flight of the Concords love and and so people are in, enjoying your names is is there any chance the public may be able to name a mission yeah yeah i mean uh we, we generally what we do is we um when we have a new mission if it's a dedicated ride we work with the customer to come up with the name if it's um if it's kind of got a few few folks on it um we just open it up to the staff and we have kind of rolling register of, of names but sure i mean um yeah we, we can open it up to the public uh, we're getting super rocket nerdy now. We, we're going to the electric turbo pump. Um, mm -hmm. One question was, was you know, kind of why did you guys do that and why hadn't it really been done before? And then one very technical question, um, is there a vibration reduction by using an electric turbo pump versus a normal one? Yeah, so we went down that road. Um, you know, we, we felt that if you if you distill apart a, a rocket engine, the most complex, you know, complicated elements of a rocket engine are the turbo machinery. So if you can turn turbo machinery into essentially software and have one moving part um, and no, no massive thermal gradients or turbine, you know, pre-burners and all that kind of jazz, it just makes it so much simpler. Um, so uh, so that, that was kind of the motivation for doing that. And, um, you know, there's, there's lots of wonderful um, things that you get uh, through the system like propellant utilization, um, you know, infinitely variable throttle, infinitely variable OEF ratios and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's super good. Uh, from a vibration standpoint, I mean, you don't have the combustion dynam dynamics of a pre-burner. So yes, you can, you could argue that it's, it's um, in some respects, it's quieter, but uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, the most, the majority of the vibration is, is caused by the combustion device and any, any, um, you know, acoustic mode you have going on in there. So, you know, it's sort of a little bit removed from the, from, you know, the pumping inlet side. Are there any plans for a European, um, specifically Scotland in this question, uh, launch site, or, you know, obviously you guys have your hands full with, uh, mm. New Zealand, and the U S but, but any, any future ambitions there? Yeah, we took a good look at actually the, um, the the Scotland range, and when we we did all the flight safety against that range, um, we really only popped out with two trajectories that we could even fly, and um, you know, there's from a safety perspective, and those two trajectory corridors weren't commercial corridors, so um, you know, they're, they're like some weird inclination that we couldn't sell. So, um, so it, it really didn't make commercial sense for us. Um, and you know we're keeping an eye on on the European market, and the one good thing is it doesn't take us long to build a launch pad. Um, and it was nine months to build one in Virginia, so um, at a later date, if there's if there's an opportunity there, we think is is, is worth it. Um, uh, the team's getting pretty good at building launch pads. Yeah, uh, I got a question, not to put you too hardcore on the spot, but uh, you know, in a couple oh, of here weeks. Here we go. <laughs> well, in a couple of weeks, SpaceX might be. Um, 
my, you know, if everything stays on track, we'll, we'll be flying two humans to the International Space Station. First time the U.S. has, has been able to do that in a long time. Um, it raised a lot of questions about kind of like, you know, even though this was very much done in partnership with NASA, not only NASA money, but but people and technology um, and the will. Uh, but, you know, raised a lot of questions. NASA's building its own large rocket to do this kind of thing that's been heavily delayed and cost a lot of money. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what, what do you think? What do you think the role, and we've got? We've got you guys. We've got we've got Blue Origin coming on pretty strong. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you think the role of NASA should be over the next 10 years? I mean, should it evolve from from there are spots where they're competing with a pretty vibrant industry right now. And and so what do you, you know, what would you like to see NASA do over the next 10, 20 years? Well, I think Ness is Ness and, and Jim um, Bridenstine, he, he he well understands this, right? Is is let let private industry do what private industry does well, um, and that that's exactly why we've got this super exciting, you know, commercial launch of astronauts. I mean, that was that was the best thing NASA could do, um, and you know, we we have uh, we have this really exciting commercial mission um, to the moon. So uh, I think I think they're you know I think they're, they're doing it exactly right right now is um uh you know engaging commercial industry getting them um to to do the things that rightly so this this day and age um you know we commercial industry should be flying humans to the space station um that's that's completely reasonable and doable thing and and nasa can focus on the things that um that that don't make commercial sense yet so th this is this is the role of governments, right? Is um, you know things that are important either for the nation or for humanity. Um, that this is where governments, you know, governments can can really provide huge value. Uh, things that um, you can turn a buck on um, and and actually you know make profitable. Private industry should absolutely absolutely do it. And I think this is where I think they've got it just right right now. Is there anything like philosophical that can be said about a private space company getting to this point, especially in the middle of this pretty grim time globally, you know, I mean, it, these are always seen as inspirational um, events. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know, does it touch, pull on your heartstrings at all? Or, you know, w what does it say to you that, you know, hopefully everything goes fine, but assuming it does. I just think it's awesome. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's incredible. And, and Elon and the team at SpaceX have just done just done a wonderful job. It's a beautiful looking capsule. Um, it's it, it's yeah. It's just like I say. I'm 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 always in the front row uh, cheering anybody. Um, and uh, and especially especially that team is they've they've just they've built a beautiful thing and and um, done something really really hard. And I think this really cements the a new era in in human spaceflight. I think. Um, there's no going back from here. It's just awesome. All right. I'm only doing this to you because there's three questions about it. <laughs> um, have you have you studied the Iranian and North Korean rockets, and what do you make about their orbital ambitions? Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with their vehicles. Yep, um, and uh, they're, they're 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 you know leveraged heavily, heavily leveraged off um, things like Scud missiles and things like that. Um, so there's, there's 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 a lot of um, you know, scale up going on in there. Um, look, I, I think um, one of the one of the responsibilities, uh, you know, certainly when when you create an orbital capability, is is making sure you use it for good. So um, you know, um, I, it, I'm, I'm like everybody else is is that um, you know there's a there's a huge um, responsibility that goes along with developing this technology um, and. Uh, you know, having having uh, the wrong technology in the wrong hands is 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 not a is, is not a wonderful thing. Um, okay, so we are about to wrap up. We're about to to end, and um, you know, I've known you for a while. I've done like a lot of research about Rocket Lab and and your background and stuff. So maybe if you don't mind riffing for just a second, especially for for younger people who are watching this. I mean, you were we talked about it before. You were a little bit of a lone wolf to some degree um, growing up, you've ended up managing a, a, a very large company at this point. Um, what, 
what's been like the the hardest lesson you've learned and and what sort of advice would you impart to people you know who who want to go from becoming an engineer to becoming a CEO of a of a real company I think it's it's firstly going after something that, that you believe in and that it ultimately is big. Um, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in, in going after really big problems because you know small problems, the, the delta between solving a small problem and a big problem is not huge, uh, especially in a business sense. So um, go after the really big, um, really big problems, and um, you know, just work hard. I mean, there's 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 no there's no there's no magic here. Um, it's just you know be passionate about you want what, what you want to do and 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 work hard and um, you know it's that's pretty much just it um, yeah, so, yeah. I, mean, I mean it's prob probably not very inspirational but that's that's the fact of it all is that there's 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 no there's no kind of magic recipe here or something I've done that nobody else has done or some mentor or anything it's just you know I just, I just think it's critically important that um, we, we, we build infrastructure in orbit and go to Venus yeah. um, and just just work hard, like, um, yeah. Get stuff done. Uh, no. Just I get mean, stuff I think, done. I think that's it's a, it's a great lesson, and, and, I mean, there's just no, especially in uh, in rocketry, there's no cheat codes or anything like that, so. Yeah, um, no, 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 no. <laughs> the, the, the rocket gods rule, rule supreme. The moment you take a shortcut, you know about it. Yeah. Um, well, Pete, thanks so much for doing this. Good luck on your your next launch, and and um, you know you know thanks for being so generous with your time. We appreciate it. No problems. Thanks, Ashley. All right. Cheers, mate. Good luck. Cheers. Thanks.